surprised. And even when I say I'm happy to be in the capital of Texas, I recognize there are those who do not look at Austin with the same feeling of admiration that some of you may. Because occasionally out in the boondocks, like Fort Worth, we know the legislators meet in Texas, the city. And everybody's afraid when the legislature meets for fear of what they're going to do. And then, of course, there's that grand old army named the IRS that has its office in Austin, Texas. And again, people hear that with trepidation. But I'm happy to be with you. I've been received very friendly among you, and I thank you for your hospitality. So glad to be with you tonight and have a number of friends and audience of gospel preachers. I can't help but think in terms of the age barriers, both senior pre preachers are here tonight. Brother Craig might not have objected that too much. And young preachers are here tonight. And that gives hope for the future. But I know the preachers are more important more important to God than all of us together. We're all Christians together. But I do have a knowledge of what the busy schedule the preachers have in the evenings. And I'm thankful that all of you are here. As it's been announced tonight, we want to talk about the preeminence of Christ. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus asked the apostles, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Then later in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 42, he asked, What think ye of the Christ? On both of those occasions, people had to come up with their opinion of what the Christ was. Of course, Peter answered by inspiration about the Christ, the Son of the living God. But we recognize that not everyone has the same opinion of Christ. There are some statements made in the Word of God that explain Jesus Christ, and I would like to call your attention to what the Bible says about Jesus. And to show you, as has been announced, what the Bible says about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. How Jesus ranks first over everyone else. With regard to various things, Jesus Christ is first. The Bible certainly teaches that, and I believe that we're going to have the right kind of an attitude by our Lord and Master. We've got to enthrone Jesus Christ in our hearts the way God revealed Him to be. I cannot imagine Jesus and make Him as my image. I think there are those who try to idolatrize Jesus in the sense they want Jesus to be like they want him to be. But if I'm to receive Jesus Christ in my heart as Lord and Master, I must receive him the way Jesus Christ has been presented by the Father and the way he is by his nature, the way that he is. When someone tries to receive Jesus Christ in a false way, they haven't really understood to receive Jesus Christ. I've been persuaded that one of the reasons why individuals around the holiday period known as Christmas, why they say a lot about Jesus during that period of time is because then they think of him in the manger. People can gather around the manger scene in their home and get drunk with eggnog and whatever else they want to do and still claim to love Jesus because Jesus is in the manger like a little baby. Jesus did not remain a baby. Jesus became the Son of God by his, not only by his nature, but also by the fact that he was raised from the dead, in Acts 13. And that I'm going to receive Jesus Christ. I can't isolate Jesus down in the manger, but I must receive him not only as the one who hung on the cross and died for my sins, but I must also receive Jesus as the one who ascended on the high and thanks to God's right hand. Now, if I'm going to have Jesus Christ in my life in a way by which my sins can be forgiven, I must learn to enthrone Christ in my heart as He really is. I must understand Jesus. By the grace of God, we have statements of the Scriptures that describe Jesus Christ and all His fullness. We're going to be looking primarily tonight at the book of Colossians, but I want to look with you first of all at some of the passages from the book of Ephesians. If you will, please, begin with me in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, where we have the statement made that with regard to Jesus Christ, that God was summing up in Christ all things. In verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him in whom also we have obtained and inherited being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The idea very clearly is that Jesus Christ is the fullness of all the things that 
God going to bring to mankind. In chapter 3, this old beginning in chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul said to me, the less and the least of all the saints of this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. So you have the fact there clearly said that God had in mind Jesus Christ. He was going to do things with Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all of that in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the summation of all these things. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 1, speaking about the glory of Jesus Christ and what he was, as the expression of the mind of God, he said in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I believe that that's some of the grandest language that the human tongue can ever speak. When you begin to recognize that when you say that Jesus Christ is the express image of God's person, that he's the illusion of the glory of God, he is the bright shining forth of all that it means to be God. As he told Philip in John chapter 14, if you would come to know God, come to know me, because if you know me, you've known the Father. We need to recognize, therefore, that whatever concept I have of Jesus Christ, whatever mindset I have about the Lord, it's got to be because I have read the Scriptures, I understand the Christ that has been set forth in the Word of God, and I'm willing to receive Him as He declared to be the Son of God. I can make Him no less than what He is, and when I properly understand Jesus Christ, I cannot glorify Him enough, because He is indeed God in the flesh. That in mind, now I want to come to the book of Colossians because some have said, I think rightly so, that the book of Colossians extols the preeminence of Christ. And when we're talking about the preeminence of Christ, by definition it means the one who takes precedence over all things, first in rank or influence or importance. And so we're going to be talking about the preeminence of Christ in the Colossian letter. And when you look through the Colossian letter, you began to read the various verses that are there. There is a natural outline, not something that I manufactured. There is a natural outline that suggests those things over which Jesus Christ has preeminence. And I simply want to go through some of these things that you would call to your mind for our mutual benefit. The things that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is preeminent concerning. But now when I get through with the knowledge of these, I want to make some applications. I believe that these things that are taught in the, book, in the book of God are not simply glowing generalities. I believe that truths have consequences. And there are certain conclusions that I have to draw in order to be right with God based upon the things concerning Jesus Christ. There are some people who seem to be unable to draw those conclusions. There are some people, I believe, that are unwilling to draw those conclusions. And the end result is someone wants to disassociate Jesus Christ as the preeminent one from any kind of practical application of that in our lives. When I get through looking at what the Colossian letter says about Jesus Christ and his being preeminent concerning these things, first in rank or importance concerning these things, I believe there's an application that must be made if I can understand my relationship to Jesus Christ and to the world round about me. There are some things that I cannot participate in to be true that Christ is preeminent in my life. And I want to look at some of those things. First of all, beginning in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, I want to notice that Jesus Christ is preeminent with regard to the creation. That is, that when it comes down to the creation of Jesus Christ, or the creation of the world, that Jesus Christ is first. Now that doesn't mean that he's a created being like the Jehovah's Witness try to teach. Jesus is not created. He's God in the flesh. The Bible very clearly teaches that he had a pre-existence with God before the world came into being. Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse 5. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 58, Before Abraham was, I am. 
And if I understand that properly, Jesus is claiming the same characteristics of being eternally as God the Father said that he was when he told Moses to go down and tell the people of Israel and, and Pharaoh of Egypt that the I am sent you. And so Jesus Christ then is not a created being, but he is first preeminent over the created things. Beginning in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And verse 17 adds that he is before all things, and in him all things consist. If I understand that correctly, from Genesis chapter 1, when the Bible says, Let us make man in our image, Jesus Christ was in the garden, I read it in the beginning, and was was a participant in the creation of man and all the universe. He's going to go over the night and begin to rain a little bit. Have you ever really looked at a raindrop and wonder why it's shaped the way that it is? Why is it that when you go down to the beach and look out across the ocean, it seems like the water is above your head, that the water ought to come rushing in on top of it? Why is it the world operates with the principles that it does as far as physics? And those laws and reasons, we understand all those laws. Paul asserts in Christ in verse 18 that Jesus Christ is the power by which all these things consist. And I understand that to mean that he's the power by which the whole universe is held together. I believe that we're not far of the presence and power of Jesus Christ our Lord, that there are planets in the universe that all fly from different directions, and the earth itself will disintegrate. Not only was Jesus Christ present in the beginning and a participant in the creation of all the universe, but the Bible says that also he is preeminent over these things because in him all these things consist. They take their form in Jesus Christ. The very laws of physics that we can read about, that we try to understand, are those laws which have their power in Jesus Christ our Lord. So the very universe of which we live, breathe, and have our being, all that, Take its form and its shape and its power and its structure by Jesus Christ our Lord. In verse 1, in verse chapter 1 and verse 19, we go on to say, For it pleased the Father that in him, we'll go back to verse, in verse 18. I said verse 17 a moment ago, verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Here again, now we're talking about something on which Jesus Christ ranks. As first or preeminence over the church. Contrary to what some people seem to think, the Pope is not the head of the church. Some brotherhood paper is not the head of the church. There's not some college that's the head of the church. There's not a group of churches that's the head of the church. The Boston Crossroads movement, movement the discipling movement among brethren, suggests that the Boston church is the mother church. And all the other churches are fit somehow out of the superstructure of the Boston church. And they will be the head of the church. I don't believe Jesus is advocating in favor of the church in Boston. I believe Jesus Christ is still the head over all things in the church and the church takes its orders from the head of Jesus Christ. I can never truly understand the church of Jesus Christ unless I learn that the church takes its orders from Jesus Christ. When brethren are trying today to reorder the church, try to restructure the church, they're making a mistake because they've attempted to replace Jesus Christ as preeminent. In the 70s, I believe, 1970, the Christian church went through what they call a restructuring. They said they were dissatisfied with the autonomy of the local church. And they felt like that they wanted to be a denomination among denominations. And they just voluntarily decided, decided we're going to restructure the church. Well, first of all, they had already restructured the church, in their view, from the standpoint of the apostasy of the generation ago. But now they're going to restructure it further, go deeper into sin, because they're going to make it a denomination of one denomination. At least they recognize what it had become. The point of all that is, though, they had no power to restructure the church. When Jesus Christ built the church the way that he built it, as he promised to build it in Matthew 16, verse 18, he gave the church the structure, the order, the design of it, just like God gave the design of a raindrop. 
And I have no more ability to change the church and its structure than I have the ability to change the rain drops the way it forms and the way it falls. All of that is in the hands of God Almighty through Jesus Christ our Lord. We need to recognize tonight that Jesus Christ stands as preeminent over the church. And there are multitudes of our religious neighbors who don't understand that at all. One time when I lived in North Carolina, there was a man who met this preacher, came to the post office at the same time I came up, and he was getting a great big package out of the post office, and he was real thrilled. He said, because we were getting a new portrait of John Wesley, the head of our church. They were going to hang it in the, in the, uh, uh, the auditorium, the sanctuary, he called it. Well, I'm thankful tonight that we have the head of the church that his picture cannot be displayed on our walls. He is in heaven with Almighty God, standing at God's right hand. Amen. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We need to understand that that's true from what the Bible teaches. But then also, He is the fullness of all that the Bible says of God. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father, that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him were the things on earth, the things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And when you talk about the fullness, that's somewhat of a difficult concept to talk about. But chapter 2, verse 9, says the same thing. When he said, For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The word fullness is used there. It has to do both subjectively and objectively. In the sense, if you want to look at it any way you want to look at it, whether you want to talk about that which fills up something, if you want to say that Jesus is the fullness in the sense of that which fills up something, Jesus is that which fills it up. Have you ever seen a glass of water that's so full of water that if you put a drop in, a drop came out? And that may be a crude illustration, but the idea that you just can't put anything else in that glass of water because it's full. And when it's talking about Jesus Christ being the fullness of whatever it is that is in prospect, Jesus Christ is the fullness of it to that degree. But I know the slayers say that it has to do from the subjective viewpoint also if you want to look at it from that which is filled up, that Jesus Christ is also the fullness. And all that saying is that any way you want to look at it from within or from without, however way that God went about bringing all things into being, Jesus Christ is the fullness of all of that. When you look at the Garden of Eden and recognize that when the man in Genesis chapter 3 fell from grace, and we have continued in walking in a willful way ever since then. What we lost in Adam, whatever that might be, whatever we lost in Adam, we're going to regain in Christ. Brother Obi wrote the book, The Free of Life, Lost and Regained. And of course, the idea there is that whatever was lost in, in the Garden of Eden, in Adam, and through our sins, through Jesus Christ, we're going to get all of that back. And then he commented on the fact the idea that the Free of Life has now been transplanted to heaven. We'll find you there in Christ Jesus, all that we walk. We'll find again together in Jesus Christ. Well, you want to talk about the redemption that was begun in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? Well, you want to talk about the sacrifices, of the, that the bloody animals was but a, a pale imitation of the imitation of Christ? Well, you want to talk about Jesus Christ as high priest? Well, you want to talk about any aspect of the plan redemption from beginning to end? Point is being made by Paul and the Colossians that Jesus Christ is the preeminent one because he is the fullness of all that God wants us to have in Jesus Christ. And the idea, of course, is not, it's not anything lacking. How many times have you seen a cartoon about somebody packing their suitcases and going off on vacation? And they get about 50 miles down the road and somebody says, Oh, I don't think I talk, I don't think I turned off the coffee pot. We forgot something. Or I left my overnight. I left all that case sitting on the cat at the back of it. And we tend to forget things. And the point of Jesus Christ being the fullness is that God hasn't forgotten anything. That whatever it is that God wanted to bring about through the work and person of Jesus Christ, Jesus has done it all. It is a completeness that's under consideration. <coughs> I mentioned earlier the fact that some brethren have a big discussion over whether or not Jesus Christ gave him his deity when he became flesh. I don't know how in the world you can understand Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and even have a question about it. When you talk about Jesus Christ being the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that's exactly what it means. 
And when the Bible talks about Jesus Christ being God in the flesh, that's exactly what it means. And I know there are those who try to poke fun at the idea of Jesus Christ being uh, uh, 100% flesh and 100% spirit. And how could that be? That doesn't present a problem at all. Jesus Christ in his flesh as a man is 100% man. Jesus Christ in his Godhood is 100% God. And if somebody has a problem with that, I would suggest to you you have a problem with your own nature. Because man is both body and spirit. And that makes me some kind of split personality. Then so be it. But the Bible asserts that Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I'm just going to take it as that. When brethren began to go beyond those terms and try to define those terms in such a way as to try to fit some kind of theological concept that's foolish to start with, I believe we're getting out of what we ought to be as gospel preachers and trying to be theologians. I believe there are too many theologians in the world today and not enough gospel preachers. So we need to get back to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But not only is that so, but the Bible says with regard to Jesus Christ that he is also the knowledge that he is preeminent as far as knowledge is concerned. In Colossians 2 now, beginning in verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for those uh, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and the Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now let me pause here just a moment. The word mystery, I hear people today talk about, well, you can't understand the Bible because it's just a mystery. And uh, I know a preacher one time, a plain big gospel preacher, who said there were just certain things about Christ you couldn't understand because they're just so mysterious. A person to make that kind of a, of a statement doesn't understand the use of the term mystery in the Bible. Paul said in Ephesians 3 verse 4, if I really read, you can perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. If I hold up my hand and I have an object in it, it's a mystery to you because you do not know what's in my hand. I could have one of a thousand different things in my hand. And it's a mystery to you because you don't know what it is. I know because it was in my pocket and I know what I've got and you don't know what I've got. It's a mystery to you. But when I open my hand and I show you that I've simply got my keys, it's not a mystery to you anymore. And when the Apostle Paul talked about the fact that he had made known the mystery, he was talking about the fact that there was a time when the plan of salvation was unknown to anybody, not even known among the angels. It was unknown, and that in the, the fact that it was unknown, it was a mystery to us. But that through the apostles, now we have that mystery made known. God has explained that mystery, how that God was going to save the world in Jesus Christ. It's not a mystery anymore. It's known. And the apostle Paul, when he writes to the Colossians church, trying to talk to his brethren about he wants them to understand about Jesus Christ being for him. He's showing them that it's through Jesus Christ that this knowledge is manifest, and that he stands preeminent over that knowledge. It is through him that we come to understand this plan of redemption, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should receive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. There are those in the Bible described as the Gnostics, those who claim to have some kind of superior knowledge, and they felt like that they have found the key to being sinful and enjoy the world and its flesh, and still be a Christian. And John took issue with these individuals and showed them that their knowledge was knowledge falsely so called, not true knowledge at all, but pseudo knowledge. 
And here he said before Jesus Christ says the real expression of the knowledge of God. Good people, you can never get higher in your concepts of ideas when you understand Jesus Christ. Most of us have an ego factor. But among philosophers who are lovers of wisdom to start with, they really have an ego factor. And what they try to do sometimes is try to find some fancy way of saying a thing that in effect is patting themselves on the back and extolling human wisdom. And the philosophers sit around trying to find some way of a new way of saying things or trying to find some new thing as they did in Acts chapter 17. And I've been positively amazed at how little and how susceptible people are. You know, the more educated we become, the more susceptible we are to everything. Philosophy and deceit. You know, all this education we've got to get America. All the preaching that has gone on. How many years now that America has had gospel preaching going on over radios and through the printed page and all kinds of tracks, uh, gospel meetings in the boondocks and the big cities and all the various places the gospel has been going forward and people still reject the gospel and hold the vain ideas of philosophy. Every once in a while, I read this out about some, uh, about some entertainer who's made a million dollars and said so they want to find who they are. And so they go to a cave in India. And there's a nut over in India sitting in a cave contemplating his navel. And so they think he's found the secret of life. So he spent a million dollars for some nut in India, some guru. <laughs> Because he has the secret of life. And I'm going to tell you. Aristotle and all the philosophers of the Roman and Greek world do not know as much about life as you know when you accept Jesus Christ and eternal life found in him. And the Apostle Paul was well aware of that. When people came claiming this superior knowledge and claiming to have some kind of intellect and depended upon philosophers and not upon the simple faith in Jesus Christ. Paul reminded the people in Colossae that if you don't know anything at all, you come to know Jesus Christ and you have the knowledge that is true knowledge. And I don't have any patience for people who turn aside from Jesus Christ. And it seems so strange that people, the nuttier they are, the more people will have. Years ago, there was a man, a newspaper reporter, that stood on the streets of New York City. To just test people how gullible they are. And he went around taking them a collection for the widow of the unknown soldier. And people were generous in here. And you may have to think about that. The widow of the unknown soldier. People can write books and come up with the nuttiest kind of ideas. Have anybody ever seen a late night television? This guy in television wears his odd caps and smokes a big fat cigar and, and curses and playing how church and he raises Tennessee walkers. I saw him one night on television and he said, I want a hundred people to send me ten thousand dollars. Light up those phones. And here came ten thousand dollars for people pouring in. Nutty as a fruitcake. L. Ron Hubbard has written a book and it's all on newsstands and advertised on television and Brother Bob was out in West Texas one of the churches in West Texas was about decimated by the invasion of the teachings of Scientology. Well, what in the world is Scientology? It sounds big. Scientology was invented by L. Ron Hubbard who said that he used to live on another planet and he came to Earth from another planet. And he had a machine that you can stick your fingers in that's going to read your electrical patterns, patterns and tell you how much engrams you have in your body. And if you read his books and give him some money, he's going to tell you how to get rid of your engrams. Now, that's the word he uses to say. And people in the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord, join Scientology. People, are, what's happening to us? You let some nut come along and stand on a street corner and proclaim himself as the latter day prophet, and people flock to him by the thousands, and that's some gospel preacher preach a simple message of truth, 
and determined out here that I've never understood that about the human race. Well, I won't tell you, we're done. When we turn away from the knowledge that's in Christ Jesus and our Lord, all of them are full of philosophical type people who think they found some great thing in some philosopher who's been dead 2,000 years ago. And if the truth could be known, he wishes he knew tonight what you know in Jesus Christ, if he could change places again. But because he's been dead, because he's still got his books, so that people think he's some great somebody. And all the world we've got to do is just understand about Jesus Christ. Our Lord. But not only is that so, but the Bible also teaches that Jesus Christ is preeminent with regard to the law. In chapter 2 and verse 13, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now he's talking about the law of Moses. I don't know if anybody here tonight will sure dispute that. But in addition to the law of Moses, I would simply say that that's true with regard to all law. In that Jesus Christ is the expression of the will of God. Therefore, Jesus Christ stands at the epitome of all law. He is the expression of the will of God. You cannot know anything about what God would have you to do in any way except as it's been expressed by Jesus Christ. There is not a law on the face of the earth that supersedes Jesus Christ's law. He stands at the pinnacle of the expression of the mind of God. There's never been a time when man has been apart from God's law. I hear all the time people who misunderstand the truth and they try to teach Calvinism. And they say, well, we're not under law anymore. But people, there's never been a time when man has been free from law. I'm a creature under God, my creator. And I have never been apart from the law of God. Now I'm apart from the law that justifies by law keeping. I understand that. But I'm not free from the law of God. And Jesus Christ is the expression of the will of God. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. Plainly says that there was a time when God spoke through the prophets and various ones in different ways. But now he spoke through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is the one through whom all people come to understand God and his law. Furthermore, the book of Romans, chapter 8. Here the Apostle Paul discusses three different kinds of law. Look at me in Romans 8, verse 1. Paul said, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Notice now verse 2. Here's one law. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's one law. That's the law that's made me free from the law of sin and death. That's another law. Then verse 3 says, the law, the law could not do. That's the law of consideration, Colossians 2, the law of Moses. But it would be any law. There's no law that by law of justification, by keeping the law perfectly, can save me. For the law could not do, if it was weak to the flesh. God did by sending his own son the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. James 1 and 25 talks about the perfect law of liberty. In Romans chapter 8, it is called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the same law. Because it sets me free from the law of sin and death, I won't tell you. I'm not under any law tonight, but the law of Christ, our Lord. And yes, I'm under law. And I need to understand that I'm under law. Then with regard to worship, Jesus Christ is also a friend with regard to worship. In chapter 2 again, this time with verse 18. Let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his own flesh and mind, and not holding fast to the head. Now he discussed that back up in the previous verse. From whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase which is from God. Therefore, if you die in Christ from the basic principle of the world, why, though living in the world, do you, do you subject yourself to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all, which, uh, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have a share of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, 
So there was no old bag. You can't stand little this the way. So in not only worship, but with the guard of moral call, code, that the world will try to bind upon us. Paul is saying that Jesus Christ is preeminent over every kind of worship. And it is over every kind of moral code. Because that was back in humanism. That back in hedonism. And that back in universalism. And that back in every other kind of issue. Jesus Christ goes over all those things. And finally, just to sum all those things up, he says then in chapter 3, and verse 16 and 17, that the word of Christ dwelt in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything, Jesus Christ stands in preeminent concerning everything in the world. Now then, I know that I haven't exhausted that whole thing, but I'm going to move on because of time and motivation. And say to you that there are some conclusions that must be drawn because of what these verses teach. Those things are not some connected to reality. They're not some connected to human life. And there are some people that seem to be either unwilling or unable to draw the conclusions that these things say. That Jesus Christ is indeed head over all things. If he's all in all, then all other religions without Christ are vain and empty. Now that's the conclusion you've got to draw. I know there are courses you can take at UTAI here to talk about world religions. And I want to place all the great reformers and all the various religious leaders of the world in the power of Jesus Christ. And they want to say that it's just as good to be a Buddhist or a Shinto as it is to be a member of the body of Christ. I deny every bit of it. That's not because I'm so smart, but because the Bible reveals Jesus Christ as being ahead of all things, he's preeminent of all things, and there's not a man that will walk on the face of the earth that has a right to hold himself up on the level of Jesus Christ. <coughs> So when I draw a conclusion then, based upon the preeminence of Jesus Christ, the conclusion I'm forced to is that any religion that excludes Jesus Christ or supposed to bring Jesus down to the level of some other man is a false religion. But let's draw another conclusion. If Christ is all in all, if Jesus Christ is preeminent over all things, from the created beings down to everything else, then any religion that denies the teaching of Christ is false. That's back in our denominational prayer. When our denominational prayer try to tell us, as the Hiscox Manual does, that in the beginning of the church, baptism was the door of the church and all the blessings that you find in Christ Jesus through baptism, but now they say it's different. Now, I've got that book in the library, it didn't probably let us do. Here's a man who says, well, here it was in the days of the Bible, but now then, somebody has voted on it, and that's not the same anymore. It's different. Before 1910, the Methodist discipline says that all children were born of the devil. And the Methodist people didn't like that, so they had a conference and rewrote the Methodist discipline. And after 1910, you get one before 1910, and compared with the one after 1910, you'll find now they say that children are born of God. Well, we understood that all the time. But some were back along the line that they had someone trying to say that here's something the Bible teaches, but they have the authority to teach something other than that. Any time any denominational doctrine violates the clear teachings of the Word of God, it's wrong because Christ has all the evidence. Well, let's draw another conclusion. If Christ is all in all and friend over all things, then all religion that offer salvation in some way other than through Christ are false and wrong and bread and not what have to do with them. I'm paging Freemasons and Masonry. I find brethren sometimes who don't seem to understand that it's as wrong to be a part of the Masonic Lodge as it is to be a part of any denominational body on the face of the earth. Because you can't go to heaven in the Masonic Lodge, yet they teach that you can. And I've got their books, and their books are not a secret anymore. You can buy any of their books, you can read any secret that they've ever published, that they ever hold to themselves. And I've been in times when I've had to hold, hold funerals in common with those of the Masonic Lodge, and I've determined never to do it again. 
I held a funeral in North Carolina one time with a, a man who had belonged to the Masonic Lodge and somebody's family. No, he did. He was a member of the Masonic Lodge. Family said uh, they wanted me to be a part of it. Well, I was allowed by the Masonic Lodge to be a part of the funeral inside the chapel. But because the Masonic Lodge considers me a profane person, because I'm not a part of their superior right and knowledge, I wasn't permitted to have anything to do with the funeral when they took over. And they gave that man a sprig of evergreen and a white apron and said, whether he'd been a member of the Lord's body or not, he was going to go to the Grand Lodge and Earth. Now, if I understand what the Colossian letters say, if Jesus Christ is preeminent in all things, and those in these lodges that have fellowship with pagans and heathens and don't believe in Jesus Christ and the Son of God at all, yet because of participation in a lodge, that they're going to die and go to heaven just like the man who's believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, and I don't understand the book of Colossians. And I preached a sermon like this one time at home while I was living in Sherman, Texas, and I thought I was going to get with it. And I'm not exaggerating at all. A man stood up when I got through preaching and chewed me out. He never gave one answer to what I said, but he made him mad at what I preached. And what I'm preaching makes you mad. I said, yes, you go to look at Colossians. And you read it carefully, you try to find out if you can go to heaven in some way that excludes Jesus Christ. If you can prove to me that you can go to heaven by a sprig of green and a white apron, and Jesus Christ died for naught across the heaven. Brethren, it's a conclusion to be wrong. When you understand that Jesus Christ is preeminent over all things, and you need to come out of all those relationships that deny Jesus Christ is preeminent. Jesus Christ. 
If he's not a manger, baby anymore. If he's not just a man walking around in Galilee anymore. Jesus Christ is not him hanging on Calvary anymore. Jesus Christ is Lord and Master because he's come forth right from death and the grave, standing with God right hand of God. He's got the right to rule in your life. My friend, he's got the right to rule in your life. We must become obedient to Jesus Christ, subjected to his will. Tonight, the song is all. If you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ, we implore you. Subject yes. yourself to the obedience of Jesus Christ and enthrone him in your heart. Lord and Master. If you're not a Christian, you want to come down to the front tonight and confess your faith in Jesus Christ. Do that time.